Terry um, Sinowski is, um, well, he's director of the um, Computational Neurobiology Lab at Salk. He's an HHMI investigator. He runs the Institute for Neural Computation at UCSD. Several other things. Was elected, and you may congratulate him to the Institute of Medicine just a couple of days ago. So congratulations on that, Terry. Thank you. Um, and has been pioneering in this field, decision making, neuroeconomics, for for some time now, and is going to do, give us a quick uh, link here between this t uh, Paul's talk, and then we'll go to Phil Zimbardo to finish off this session. So uh, thanks to uh, Roger and all the speakers. Um, so this is a session on your brain on money. And um, many p of us know uh, people who see the world through rose-colored glasses. But what I want to convince you here, and I'm going to give you just one uh, real piece of evidence for it, but there's an enormous amount of evidence that uh, is, is, is really uh, piling up so that it's, it's, it's something that uh, is very, very uh, solid, is the fact that actually uh, we all have green colored glasses, which, as you know, is the color of money. So um, Rama, in his talk yesterday, alluded to a book chapter that uh, we published together uh, with Pat Churchland back in 1994. And in this book chapter, which was entitled A Critique of Pure Vision, um, after uh, Kant's book on a critique of pure reason, we assembled all of the evidence to uh, ask the question of whether or not the assumptions that are made by vision researchers, and not just in biological vision, but in computer vision, whether or not those assumptions are reasonable ones. Uh, now, he, here's a quote from a review paper Alamonis and Rosenfeld, uh, who are two researchers in computer vision, but it really does capture a fundamental assumption that almost all vision workers make when they either record from neurons in the brain or do psychophysical experiments or make um, a machine vision system. Uh, and this has to do with what, what is the ultimate goal of vision. I mean, what, why do we have it? Uh, regarding the central goal of vision as scene recovery makes sense. If we are able to create, using vision, an accurate representation internal model of the three-dimensional world and its properties, objects, where they're located, then using this information, we can perform any visual task. And so indeed, it has been the goal in computer vision to take an image of a scene, to segment out the objects, locate them in three dimensions, uh, and do that vertically so that one can actually measure how far away they are so you can reach to them uh, so that you can identify what the objects are. And that's a non-trivial problem. In fact, it hasn't yet been solved. And uh, we do it instantaneously. We take it for granted. It seems really easy for us. It's not. That's an inc incredibly difficult computational problem. Now, the, the conceptual idea here in AI is that you have a module for vision. And this module for vision, once it's accomplished the task of reconstructing the scene, passes on all that information to the planning system. The planning system now can measure distances and times and so forth for things that are moving. And it passes that information to another module, the motor system. And the motor system now computes the muscle uh, contractions or the motor actuators that you need to reach for an object. So that's kind of the, I would say, you know, the, the, the in fact, uh, not just uh, the traditional view, but the current view of probably 95% you know, of everybody working in the field. Now, what we tried to do was to assemble all the anatomical, physiological, psychophysical, uh, behavioral evidence to see whether or not this is a, actually something the brain might be doing. I'm going to give you just one little piece of evidence to indicate how far away th the brain may be from this goal. And this is called change blindness. So here's a scene, and presumably there's a vision module in your brain that is taking this in, and it's very clear what's out there. You can recognize it instantaneously, right? I mean, what, what is it uh, uh, that you see here? You see an airplane. You see a bunch of troops. I mean, you can actually make a story out of this. What I'm going to do is to blink this image, and um, I'm going to replace it with another image, which is the same as the original image, but one 
change has been made somewhere in the image. And what I want you to do is when, once you've seen the change, put your hand up. And we're going to see how long it takes members of the audience to recognize this change. And it, 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 so some people are going to be very fast. Some people are going to be very slow. This is an intelligence test. <laughs> but I want you to be honest. OK, we have one in the front here. Brian is a very smart guy here. Uh, there are a couple people here in the back. But you know, most of you don't you have your hand up. I mean, come on. What's wrong? OK, I want you to focus your attention on. Can everybody see that now? How did you miss it? Well, if your visual system is reconstructing the entire visual scene veridically, then it should be trivial. But in fact, uh, unless you're paying attention to something, if it, you, you actually don't make a full representation, internal representation of it. Uh, you, apparently, the visual system only makes partial reconstructions. And it's just an illusion that the world looks completely filled in. We know that the foveal region that you're, you know, that you're actually using for reconstructing in high resolution is only a small part, a few degrees of the visual scene. So depending on where you're looking at, you're only reconstructing a little piece of it. But because you can move your eyes around so quickly, it's possible to reconstruct the parts that are of interest to you that are important for you at that moment for perhaps doing a task. So this immediately uh, tells us that the visual system is a, in the business of, of, of doing something quite different. And what is that? Well, a lot of information uh, that uh, we, we have about vision comes from recording from single neurons in the visual system of the macaque monkey. And this is a, a diagram of the brain. This is the back of the brain. We're looking at the side. Uh, the back is on the right, and the prefrontal cortex here on the left. And you can see all these colored regions are all visual regions. It, literally half of the brain of the monkey, including some of the prefrontal regions that aren't shown here, are visual. Vision is very important for us. Seeing is believing. And, uh, and, and we know an enormous amount by uh, recording originally by Hubel and Weasel who were the first back in 1962 to report the properties of single neurons in the primary visual cortex, which analyzed very small, uh, very, uh, small parts of the visual field and uh, responded to simple features like oriented bars and edges. Uh, and uh, surrounding the primary visual cortex is another uh, set of maps. Uh, this region here, uh, V2, V3, V4, extrastriate cortex. But the area and, and, and that I'm going to be focusing on, and I'm going to give you just one piece of evidence now, uh, as I said, for this new view of vision, which is taking uh, really is, 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 is uh, really changed at least uh, the, the the idea of what the goal of vision is for for me, uh, and that is a recording here from the parietal cortex. There's an area here called LIP, which uh, has a uh, visual input, so it has receptive fields responds to visual inputs, but it also has uh, responses when you move your eyes. And it's a very n a nice area to work in. A lot of people have worked in it because you can actually look there for cells that might be responsible for making decisions about where you can move your eye next. Um, <clears throat> and, and there are other regions of the cortex down here that are important for recognizing objects. So this is the ventral part that is going to control movements. And the technique is. As I said, single unit recording. And here's an example of a tungsten microelectrode, which Dave Hubel actually helped develop, uh, recording from a, one of these pyramidal cells in the cortex that you're going to be looking at now. OK, so uh, let me just, uh, before I explain this experiment, um, let me uh, tell you what our conclusion was in our chapter. What we concluded after looking at change blindness, all the psychophysical, uh, the, the anatomical and uh, all of the behavioral work was that there's something very odd going on because it looked as if many cells in the visual system were modulated by, in fact, other sensory systems and, and what you're actually doing. It didn't look as if it was a pure vision module. And at the end, what we concluded was uh, that there, there has to be some way in which vision is uh, working together with the motor system in a much more intimate way and, and we suggested that uh, some work that had been done in my lab by Reed Montagu and Peter Dayan, which was a model of the B brain, 
uh, that uh, goes around and forages in the world might be a better way of thinking about the problem of what vision is good for, namely identifying things that might be good to eat and representing them in such a way that uh, it's accessible and easy for you to respond very rapidly when that opportunity affords itself. Okay, so now here's a, a key experiment, and Paul Glimsher, who whose lab this work was done, is one of the leaders in neuroeconomics. In fact, I think he has one of the first textbooks out on neuroeconomics. Um, did a, the classic experiment that had been done for decades, namely you put a monkey in a chair and the monkey fixates, and then one of two lights goes on, and the monkey's task is simply to look at the light that comes on. Okay, very simple task. That's been done you know, thousands and thousands of times. Now, the way you get a monkey to do that, you might ask, you know, monkeys don't normally uh, sort of sit there and, and do this for hours and hours. The way that uh, the experimenter actually shapes the monkey is by giving the monkey a drop of juice whenever the monkey looks to the target, the correct target, and not if the monkey looks to the wrong target on any given trial. And uh, th through, it may take weeks or months, uh, but monkeys can get very good at this and they work at it because this is their job, right? And, that's, and they're, they're uh, water deprived, so they get their water, daily water intake by basically doing this task. Now, for all these years and decades, nobody has ever thought to vary the amount of reward. It was always a drop of juice. And what Paul did here was to decide, let's make that the independent variable, right? The one we're going to change. Let's, for example, uh, in one block, let's have a reward of two-tenths of a milliliter of juice if the monkey moves its eye to the right, and half of that if it's to the left. And then in the second block, we're going to reverse that. And the monkey knows this. The monkey has now gotten used to the idea that the amount of reward is variable, and it knows in, in, in block one that uh, moving its eye to the right is going to give it more juice. Okay. So that there was a very simple change. But look at the res responses now as shown here on the bottom. This is a, a raster histogram. Each dot is a spike. There, there are uh, about 20 trials here. Um, and these are the two blocks. Red is the uh, block when you move your eye to the right and you get twice as much reward uh, compared to uh, block two. Now, the, the key here to the experimental design is that everything is kept absolutely identical except for the reward. Namely, the visual input is exactly the same, so there's no change in the, the, the visual world. The motor response is exactly the same. The only difference is what the mon monkey is expecting, the expected reward. So let's look at, first of all, block two. The monkey's moving its eye to the right. Uh, here at time zero is the visual response. Uh, stimulus comes up. The firing rate of a single cell now in LIP, parietal cortex, increases to 25 per second. And then uh, after the, light, the fixation light goes off, the monkey moves its eye to the right. And this is the response now for the motor response, the correlate of the action. And, uh, and that's uh, averaged over many trials. Now let's look at block one. This is the, the only thing we've changed is we've doubled the amount of reward for the very same action. The firing rate to the visual response now, when the visual response comes on, the firing rate has uh, gone up to almost 75 spikes per second, three times as many spikes per second for the very same visual stimulus, even though the motor uh, component here, the re response of this neuron when the monkey moves its eye is, is statistically identical. Now, implications of this are really quite remarkable because it's, what it's saying is that here we have a visual area of the brain that's supposed to represent veridically things in the world so that you can reach for them or move your eye to them. And the response that is representing that stimulus varies depending on what your expected reward is for looking at it, right? That's really changing the entire landscape. And I'm going to connect this now to a couple of the other talks you've heard. Uh, we know a lot about the pathways that lead to this change in response. You heard from George Kube the importance of the dopamine system for motivation and for reward. And you heard in Brian Knudsen's talk that the nucleus accumbens, which gets a very rich innervation, this is the dopamine system. And we see that the uh, ventral tegmental area and the substantia nigra, two very important dopamine nuclei, project very uh, diffusely throughout the entire uh, basal ganglia, including the nucleus accumbens, uh, 
the VTA to the nucleus accumbens and the, and the ventral uh, uh, basal ganglia, and also the entire cortical mantle is innervated with these dopamine projections very uh, broadly. So the entire brain practically is bathed in dopamine, and it's, it's, there's a lot of evidence now. In fact, it's the dopamine when, it, uh, when these neurons are activated that provides the evidence or the, uh, the input to these neurons that uh, signal that this particular stimulus is going to provide you in the future with a reward. Okay, so let me just finish by saying that, uh, by summarizing here, what are the implications? Okay, this may seem a little bit subtle, but just think about this. Suppose that you have uh, been out running and uh, you come in and you have a choice between warm water and cold water. Now the the, 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 you know, the, uh, the choice here is exactly the same in terms of the physical stimulus, but how is the warm and cold water decision represented, visual decision represented in your brain? Well, if, if you're motivated, if, if your body is telling you that it wants to cool down, then the representation of this choice here, of, of pressing this button, will be quite different. The neurons in your visual system representing that option will be firing at a higher rate than this side. But if it happens to be winter, you come in from after sh shoveling the snow, then that may be different. The visual system is not in the business of representing what's out in the world in a, a platonic sense, uh, in a pure sense. It's there to help guide your actions, telling you what's valuable to you at this moment. And that can change from time to time, depending on your state, your goals, your desires. The, the world, as you see it, is through these value-colored glasses. And, and it also explains why money has such special significance. Because when you see a dollar bill, it's not the same as seeing an ordinary piece of paper. Your brain represents it very differently. Thank you.